Well, thanks for that lead in, Randy. And and again, for mentioning my cohorts here and a shout out for them for their support, both helping me with this presentation and over the long term. So in the next few minutes, I'm going to provide a, a little bit of background uh, on climate operations and how that works from a, a big picture weather service perspective. I uh, do a review for some of the CPC products in services. We know most of the climate regional or climate region focal points uh, at the WFOs or, or service leads as I prefer to refer to them have been trained but not all of them and we have a lot of new folks in the agency so uh, we'll go a review CPC products for folks that have seen it before and it'll be new material for others and then we'll share a lot of the neat things going on uh, with offices and climate DSS across the region. So uh, I'm gonna make this presentation available, so don't worry about writing down any links you see. Uh, here, I'll, I'll push the PowerPoint slides to the local offices. But uh, climate training focuses around uh, the PDS, a professional development series, and we're undergoing a major update that was driven by the, the loss of flash, but also uh, the modules were dated enough that actually some of the science aspects uh, with research ongoing in the academic community, uh, there are some new things to share there. And as kind of a, a gap filler, we've put together the climate seminar series. You might have seen a couple of the, the ones that we've already had, but in the next few months uh, and finishing up come this winter, uh, we got some other neat topics there that hopefully you'll be able to attend and, and, and see. So to start out kind of again from that the big picture perspective, it's important to kind of clarify what are the roles of the CPC, the ROC and us in, in the WFOs. And CPC on a daily basis, they're the ones who monitor and evaluate the, the global circulation and their perspective truly is global, much, much more beyond the CONUS than what we're looking at from a daily basis. And of course, they produce the outlooks uh, that we utilize. The ROC, as we've seen in the last year or two, can provide a, a heads up on potential climate DSS messaging opportunity. You can kind of think of them as supporting our efforts. Certainly, we can monitor locally for opportunities, but having the ROC engaged too is a, a good idea. And also the ROC folks have been participating in messaging that goes out at the regional level. And frequently this is in collaboration with Doug Cluck at NCEI and our NIDIS dues partners, as well as the USDA climate hubs. But for us at the WFOs, what, what is important is, is that user and partner interaction, is understanding what the needs and the impacts are in the sub-seasonal and seasonal timeframes. And especially since this is a new or relatively new area, and some of our partners might not even know what sort of capabilities we have to provide information to support their activities in this time frame. So the user interactions are, are really important here. And in order to produce that messaging, what we do is we interpret, uh, localize and contextualize the information from CPC in the sub-seasonal to seasonal time scale. And what I mean by contextualize is uh, putting forecasts in the context of what climatology is, and that gives our users kind of a, a reference base. That graphic on the right, actually took from a presentation, Louis uses this, and the terminology, the seamless suite. I mean, we're so used to being focused on days one through seven and the world traditionally kind of ends with day seven, but the vision coming from Louis is that we actually continue on into the sub-seasonal and seasonal time frame and, and do so seamlessly. I've actually added to that that also, uh, the data and analyses from past data is also part of the, the climate messaging that goes on. So those are uh, 
important resources and, and tools there in the analysis of historical stuff. A couple of tools we have available on NWS chat, although it's quite ironic that chat is down this morning. That seems to be the way way it goes. But CPC uh, has a room that's for internal chat only, where C you can discuss outlooks with CPC or, or see their chats or pre-release information. And again, anything they put on there should not be shared publicly. Uh, before the official release time. And then in central region, we have our own climate chat room. In contrast, this is external, open to partners. And the goal here is to facilitate office to office, regional and field interaction and partner interactions. I think at this point, we initially made a push and got some partner engagement that was pretty good. But with all the problems with NWS chat, that kind of died off. But I think once we get this new uh, chat tool in place, maybe by early next year, we can again push to get the partners engaged there. But you might see announcements of information permanent to climate ops or DSS. Uh, and it can fill, facilitate office to office exchange of, of climate questions and whatnot. So we talk a lot about climate partners. It's a, a little bit different game than the weather side because there are others involved in the messaging that goes on uh, to the climate community of users. Uh, the USDA climate hubs, we have the Midwest climate hub in Ames and the Northern Plains climate hub out in uh, Wyoming. Of course, the National Drought Mitigation Center at the University of Nebraska is the driver for drought services. Great Lakes RESA, you can kind of think of RESA as a, an academic research to operations center, kind of like CIRA or SIMS do for satellite. Uh, the Great Lakes folks up there do for climate. Uh, within NOAA, you have NCEI and the NIDAS dues we interact with, of course, with us in the weather services. CPC, RFCs, the rocks, and of course us. Uh, the High Plains and Midwest Regional Climate Centers. If y'all did not hear, the Midwest Regional Climate Center is in the process of moving from the University of Illinois in Champaign to Purdue in Lafayette. I don't know exactly what that means for their webpage presence, but I know the services will definitely continue and, and continue to expand there uh, as well as, as the High Plains folks. They're excellent partners. And also don't forget our, our state climatologists and climate offices. Hopefully you have good relationships with those folks because they are definitely key partners. And each one of these groups reaches a somewhat different community. So including us, uh, the group as a whole really has pretty thorough coverage of those who are interested in, in climate information. So I kind of have the, the message down there, many voices, different perspectives, but all come together uh, providing one unified message. Some terminology that's important as we get into climate DSS, uh, subseasonal is defined in terms of CPC products in week two, week three to four products and the monthly outlook all fit within the sub-seasonal time frame. The seasonal time frame is addressed by the three months outlooks that go out to a year. Uh, you might see the acronym S2S in documents that's sub-seasonal to seasonal. Uh, decadal uh, is obviously 10 year period. I have that grayed out because that's not really an operational term, but you might see if you're looking through research information, uh, study of decadal kind of trends and whatnot is a pretty active area of research. Of course, normal or normal is now the 1991 to 2020 baseline. That's the reference. Uh, Tersiles, that's where we decide divide our normal distribution into three equal parts. Uh, 
highest third is your above normal category. The middle third is your near normal category in the subseasonal time frame. But the terminology equal chances is what's used in week three to four, monthly and seasonal. And then the lowest tercile or the lowest third is below normal. Also important, and you'll see CPC use, are the tails, which are the extremes that occur uh, on either end, the lowest or highest 15%. And I put that in a, a simple graphic here, the blue line separating your tercials of below, near, and above normal of this, this hypothetical normal distribution. And then the tails, indicated at either end by the red lines, your top and bottom 15%. So when CPC puts together a forecast, what is it that they look at? Uh, most of the world that we deal with falls into looking at that blue bar from a modeling perspective is an initial value problem. As you get to longer time scales, especially related to climate change, uh, that becomes a boundary value problem from an NWP perspective. So when we're talking climate change, uh, initial conditions and error growth uh, that we see day to day in our, our models from week one into week two and, and beyond uh, is not really an issue. It's, it's the boundaries of the modeling that are the drivers there over the very long term. But coming back to the initial value problem range of things, what CPC will look at are what are soil moisture conditions and sea ice, and especially with drought across much of the area and we're in the warm season, that obviously tends to provide a, a positive feedback to warm temperatures, uh, which can result in increased drying. So that's something they'll look at closely. Uh, the MJO, in NAO, you'll see we got some presentations coming up on, on those uh, are things they look, and it's interesting, the MJO, that what goes on in the tropics can have uh, impacts on us here in the CONUS. Uh, stratospherics have a lot of research going on with the Q, QBO and sudden stratospheric warmings. Our December climate talk will address address those. Those are things they evaluate. Of course, ENSO is a big one in, in sea ice on the longer time scales. And then as we kind of get out of the world, we generally live in in the sub-seasonal and seasonal time scales and, and edge more toward the decadal time scales where we're not really so operational. Uh, both Pacific decadal and Atlantic multi-decadal variability uh, come into play. GMST is a global mean surface temperature is uh, also a driver and then we get into uh, deep ocean responses and greenhouse gas emissions and long-term land use changes as we grade into the climate change realm again. So I'll show step through examples of the various products and See, I got the six to 10 day and eight to 14 day outlook there. Notice the six to 10 day is grayed out. Uh, the six to 10 day is an artifact of the old days for those who've been around the weather service long enough. You can remember that our, our forecasts used to only go out through day five. Uh, hard to believe that long ago. So that six to 10 day, sub-seasonal forecast at that time picked up from the end of day five. But as our skill in forecasting largely driven by the models has increased, and now we've long been doing the deterministic forecast through day seven, uh, the eight to 14 day outlook is really the complement uh, to our, our week one forecast. And, and the six to 10 day has become kind of a, albatross of sorts uh, that doesn't really quite fit in anymore. So uh, I'm dissuading using it because we have better information available from, from our forecast. And days nine and 10, we can cover 
you know, in the eight to 14 day outlook. So we see here a graphic from CPC of the temperature outlook. And I got Dallas, Texas ping there. The use of pie charts is a great way to explain these outlooks to non-technical users. And for example, at Dallas there, the pie because of the forecast of higher probabilities of above normal, the odds there are 46% chance of above normal, 33% chance of near normal, and then 21% chance of below normal. So you see the forecast of above normal comes at the expense of below normal. And one way to message these actually is to combine the normal category with the, the higher preferred category, in this case, the above. So really, you're getting a 79% chance of near to above normal temperatures. And again, depending on what potential impacts are or what people are, are interested in, you can modify that one way or the other. On the precipitation side, uh, same probabilistic type approach with the pie chart in the lower left there. I picked on Denver since they were in the, in the dry area. See a 40% chance of below normal precipitation. And what's handy with these charts is they actually give you what the normal temperatures and precipitation are. So you have a reference here. So in this case, in combining the below and near normal categories, it's like a 75% chance of not being above normal, which since being in drought mode in Colorado, that could be the, the key way to message is that the odds of, of getting a lot of rain in week two uh, are really are lower, lower than normal. Some other products that are also available in this time frame relate to the heat index on the left there and the wind chill on the right. Those are probabilities of exceeding the thresholds, which are indicated by the dashed line on the pro project on the products. So certainly as we get into the summer, that heat index uh, graphic might be one that could be handy to use or at least to look at to help message and then come next winter we'll uh, revert to wind chill mode. One of the uh, neatest products I think to come out that's useful for us in the DSS time frame is the hazards outlook and this uh, forecast uh, addresses targets of opportunity when they see patterns that suggest extremes. And this is where we're shifting away from the tercels and focusing on those tails. And in this case, the fifth, lower 15% of extreme cold, this is from last February when Texas got hit so hard. And you see they use a, a slight moderate and high categories just like SPC and the associated probabilities with those are 20, 40, and 60% respectively. This is a quick and easy product to uh, check. Both the week two outlooks and the hazard outlooks are issued by early afternoon. And, and one of the advantages of monitoring uh, the CR Climate chat room or CPC's chat room is that the bot runs and you can see when the discussions are released, uh, which indicates when the products go public. And this is a, a good time to, uh, to recognize the utility of the discussions. And it's not just about the graphics, but the discussions that go along with each of these products is information that you can use to help interpret and localize the messaging in your area. Some of the things you'll see in the week two hazards outlooks most commonly are extreme temperature and heavy rain. Occasionally, you might see mention of flood. Uh, they do address wind, especially out west, the downslope wind, they'll sometimes pick up on that. Uh, heavy snow, on occasion they might mention frozen precipitation. There certainly, we know there are synoptic patterns that are, 
are associated with major ice events and occasionally those they'll pick out. And we can infer things uh, from their outlooks too and the discussions. For example, in the spring, there's some skill at times uh, in picking out severe weather threats uh, due to synoptically evident type weather patterns. Uh, certainly uh, hot and dry forecasts this time of year with what's going on over much of the region uh, can play into drought and fire weather messaging and even the low flow high side of hydro. Uh, flood side of hydro is something we'll see some good examples of. And also river and lake ice formation in breakup. So again, hitting the point to uh, check out the discussion to get insight, but keep in mind when we're in week two, we're, we're looking at synoptically evident large scale type information. We're not gonna be able to peg any severe weather type event that's driven primarily by mesoscale. That skill just doesn't exist. But we know a few of our severe weather events come in uh, pretty identifiable synoptic weather patterns. And on occasion, uh, those sorts of patterns uh, are, are forecastable in the week two timeframe. And for example, even the Northwest flow pattern that we're transitioning to now, we could see coming a couple of weeks ago and the inference that could be made there if conditions line up right is uh, that can open the door to the traditional summer MCS parade. Week three to four outlook is a little bit different uh, than the week, week two. It uses a two class system instead of a three class. And that's evident by seeing that the probabilities in this graphic uh, along the edges of the equal chances are at 50% uh, versus 33%. So you're really uh, committing to one, one category or the other. They are looking based on feedback from their stakeholders to uh, revert this to the, to the three class system like we're familiar with in week two. Uh, this product is produced once a week on Friday, Friday afternoon, which is not the best time for messaging. But then the week three to four outlook doesn't change on a day-to-day -day forecast like our regular forecast does. Uh, they are looking at the potential of putting out an update on Tuesday, but there is value. The value of this outlook holds uh, for more than a day or two after its release. So if you need to message it on Monday, don't worry that it's three days old, it's still a, a valid outlook. So we see temperature there, and here is precipitation. Again, the category is beginning at 15%. Here next is the one month outlook, and the, the uh, interpretation is, is similar as to the week two subseasonal, except where the week two has a near normal category, the monthly and seasonal, as well as the week three to four, use the equal chances category instead of a near normal. The reason for that is, is uh, CPC over the years has uh, tracks their skill very closely. And they found that when you get out into these longer time frames, they don't have skill actually at forecasting a near normal category. So they just focus on the above, below, and equal chances. And uh, we see in this case for Davenport, the temperature forecast uh, for the monthly outlook is 37%. So not a great tilt of the odds. But uh, again, using the monthly outlook in the context of, of what we're forecasting in week one and what CPC is forecasting in their week two and three to four outlooks, generally these things all coalesce around a, a single theme. And uh, 
and the messaging should be very straightforward as a result. On the precip side here, you can see uh, they're forecasting uh, odds favoring a wet May with the 46% chance of an above normal category, combining that with the near normal category, and we're pushing almost an 80% chance, almost a four out of five chance of getting somewhere around four and a quarter or more inches of rain. And this is, uh, we enter May, June, July, August. This is our definitely our big wet season here in the Midwest. Uh, so that could be a, a sizable amount of precipitation potentially. Here's a three month outlook example, uh, same type interpretation I picked on Indianapolis here, they actually have a 50% chance of above normal. Again, comparing to the near normal category, you're up to 83% chance of falling in one of those two categories. And that comes at the expense of the below normal, which is only 17%. So if you're in Indiana hoping for a nice cool summer, the odds are clearly not in your favor. On the precipitation side, and you can see how this plays into the current drought conditions going on over much of the western U.S., uh, the odds favor or tilted toward uh, above normal over the east, and in Indy in particular, that's a 40% chance there. So here's a three-month outlook for Indy. Some things to kind of keep in, in the back of your mind, and, and these are pretty gross generalities. Uh, you can look at specific verification at the two links I provided there, but temperature verifies better than precipitation in the subseasonal to seasonal timeframes on average, and that makes sense. Temperature is a much more continuous and relatively easier to forecast parameter and precipitation, especially in the warm season, can be very hit or miss. The winter scores tend to verify better than summer scores. Uh, it's because the climate drivers are stronger and have stronger relationships to what happens in the CONUS during the winter uh, than the summer. The monthly outlooks tend to be the, the least skillful and that's because you're, you're transitioning from drivers like the NAO or AO on, on the one hand, or the MJO, which can help in that subseasonal time frame, and you're flipping toward the seasonal time frame where ENSO is a driver, and you're kind of in a no man's land in between uh, there. So, but from the big picture, the things to consider about skill is it depends on where you are in the U.S., uh, what season you're in, and what the forcing is. So if you're in the southern U.S. with a strong ENSO during the winter time, that's probably when your seasonal forecasts are most skillful. Uh, if you're in the Midwest during the summer, and there's not much going on in, in terms of like land surface forcing like with the drought or no no significant ENSO or MGO signal, uh, your skill is going to be relatively lower. So some tidbits on how to approach communicating. Uh, like so many things, being accurate and simple uh, is a good start. And in this case, focus on what's important for the unique situation. Start with what the user needs and then work backwards toward the outlooks. Uh, keep in mind, these are probabilistic forecasts. So terms like odds favor are better than making the messaging sound like it's a deterministic forecast. I mentioned and showed examples of how combining categories can actually uh, provide a, a more skillful explanation of what's going on. And again, this depends on what sort of thresholds are important to users in a uh, in a given chances in a given situation. So remember the chances are relative to normal and normal 
changes through the year. So keep in mind what your climatology is because that's the frame of reference from which the forecasts are derived. And I have a script down there you can fill out that is really the, the this is the technical thing. You can pull the numbers from the map and plug them in the, in the blanks there. And that's essentially what you're communicating. Now, this is a pretty wordy way to do it. You wouldn't want to do it this way, but it just a way to help you frame maybe how you want to, what information it is you're trying to summarize and share. Partner training, as with so many things that are relatively new, is important. Uh, simple background information for non-technical users is, is critical. And this can be an opportunity too to query for their needs and impacts. And again, I think there are a lot of users out there who don't quite know yet what we can do in these longer longer outlook time frames. So some education as to what we can do and what our skill level is out there uh, can maybe open the door for them thinking about what kind of ways they can use the information. Now for uh, more technical users, especially your media, Folks, definitely they're capable of handling more of the in-depth detail. They, some of them might even be interested in the details of the MJO and whatnot. Those seminars that you saw will be made available publicly. They've all, they all, they have been or, or will be recorded and shareable if there are folks uh, both within and outside the weather service who are interested in viewing them. And two, from the big picture, our probabilistic climate outlooks really dovetail nicely into what we're doing in days one through seven with expanding our probabilistic efforts. So one of the things we can do at the local office is, is to kind of extend our reach into the sub-seasonal timeframe uh, to keep the message, keep the message going. I'm going to shift gears and show a bunch of examples. I want to thank these offices who sent me information on my uh, data call. A lot of neat things going on in region. I know there are offices not on this list that are also doing things. We appreciate the efforts across the board that are, are going on, especially as we expand our reach in the climate DSS realm. So I, I tallied with all the data points I got how the different ways we share information. Uh, most of them I was aware of. There are a few unique ones that uh, I think were pretty cool. And, and so often there are neat things going on at individual offices that the rest of us in region don't hear about. And I know Sue's for a long time have lamented uh, the challenges associated with sharing things from office to office and this is an attempt to do so in the climate DSS realm. So obviously web pages and email are commonly used, the DSS packets or, or sit reps, social media obviously, weather stories, uh, IWT focused on actually climate products, uh, webinars both from a routine uh, perspective. Uh, some offices do them daily and include information, climate information on a daily basis and some do routine webinars every season and include it then. Uh, event driven webinars are a good opportunity to uh, work in some climate IDSS. There's an office that runs a blog that's got various climate topics on it. Uh, meetings, both virtual in the era of COVID and in person, of course, by phone. The AFD, the directive, allows us to add a climate section uh, to include records or outlook information. So that's another angle we could use. Uh, newsletters uh, can be a, a good way to share information that's not so time constrained, like a seasonal outlook, for example, uh, and custom requests, especially with regard to data and 
and data sharing is uh, another way to provide uh, climate DSS. Some of the topics uh, we have seen, again, pretty straightforward, extreme heat and cold, heavy rain or snow, spring hazards usually related to flooding and or drought, uh, both big changes in temperatures and or precipitation can be worth highlighting, as well as persistent conditions. If you've been hot and dry for the last month in your day one through seven forecast uh, remains hot and dry and you look at week two and you see probabilities are leaning toward more hot and dry, that persistence, especially if you're in drought mode, could be a, a critical information to share. Uh, the winter outlook of all the seasonal outlooks, uh, winter is the one that seems to garner the most interest and need to see that CPC is looking at, starting to look at uh, including snow in the winter outlook. That's always been one of the challenges or one of the questions at least we always get when we share the winter outlook after you spend time talking about temperature and precipitation, the inevitable question, well, what about snow uh, comes? And you can use LCAT to kind of kind of ferret out some of that information, but CPC is actually looking at making it a, a parameter in the forecast uh, permanently. Uh, freeze potential, uh, sp uh, climatologies for special event. Uh, there's a presentation on the NOAA Climate Toolkit. Uh, one office emphasized that uh, summarizing past and future conditions together is important to make that linkage. But uh, river and lake ice trends uh, on rivers related to ice jams. Uh, Lake Erie inflows, the RFC, Ohio River RFC, that's related to uh, algal bloom uh, in the summertime. Uh, spring snowmelt trends, both in the upper Midwest and in the mountain snowpack, critical part of water supply out west, uh, climate change, and things focused on agriculture. So quite a range of, of topics can get wrapped into the climate IDSS framework. The audiences that people have reached, of course, the general public is a big one, farmers and ranchers, uh, media, our media partners. You know, that week two outlook, a lot of media partners throw up that graphic of temperatures like out through day 10 or day 14. You know, God only knows where they pull those numbers from, but at least if we can uh, train them on using the CPC outlook. They can maybe get some some useful guidance beyond what what a single model or an ensemble mean uh, is tossing out there. Uh, FEMA emergency management, especially for special events, the USDA, uh, several groups in CS, climate hubs, in the Forest Service. Uh, NGOs, various organizations involved in environmental related things, state extension services, Red Cross, Coast Guard, state local governments, the Corps, the GS, uh, even NIDIS, NCEI, the National Ocean Service, uh, our audiences as our state climatologists and the RCCs. And the important thing about those folks is they are message amplifiers. So if your state climatologist is not a weather ready nation ambassador, that might be an opportunity to talk to them and, and get them engaged in that program. But we also have the EPA and, and DNR, or state conservation groups uh, are interested in these things, especially as related to, uh, to drought and water supply. So it seemed like messaging fell into one of two categories from routine messaging with the week two outlook and hazards being a focus and uh, to more occasional messaging related to the seasonal outlooks. Uh, 
and on the flip side is the event driven messaging where uh, climate information was embedded in sit reps for hydro and fire weather and whatnot and again uh, climate information can stand on its own to highlight significant changes or persistent patterns especially in the the week two time frame so we'll step through some examples here hopefully you might have seen this already the monthly and seasonal two-page outlooks that central region puts out these are technical in nature and a different author puts these together uh, each month and they're reviewed and then sent out throughout the region uh, i would encourage sharing these with local media but we did some testing here with our emergency managers and the feedback we got was uh was that they were a bit too technical for most of the partners of course i think we all have those few emergency managers who fall into the weather weenie category and they don't mind the technical stuff but by and large this is probably too technical for uh a non-technical audience but the information can be gleaned and put into a more suitable format for those folks uh, goodland shared the example of routine briefings where they include uh, last month's temperatures and precip and what the drought status is and outlook and they also include the one and three month outlooks in that and i think that's an excellent response to their local user community because remember they're in a climate where water is very critical to uh, how the world works out there and that's uh, I think a good example of of aiming messaging directly at what the key needs of their uh, local folks are I got a neat idea from from Marquette office about using diurnal climatology for event planning they have an app that they locally developed that they use themselves, but the uh, Climate app at the Midwest Regional Climate Center has an hourly climate database where you can get this diurnal climatological information that might be interested to uh, event planners. And MRCC's got temperature, wind, dew points, heat index, wind chills, all that in, in that hourly database and they also put together climatologies on the heat index and wind chill that give percentiles and number of hours above or below certain thresholds a lot of great information there for uh for dss activities uh, special event outlooks uh, these can be occasional events, for example, like St. Louis had the PGA Championship a little while back. Uh, while every year Rapid City has Sturgis going on up there in the National High School Rodeo Finals. And one of the, the neatest uh, sort of special events, so to speak, came from Pleasant Hill. And one of the forecasters there noticed that the homeless population was unusually high in their downtown area this year, presumably due to COVID and issues with, uh, with housing homeless people in shelters and trying to avoid spread uh, of the virus. And then we had that Arctic outbreak come down. So Pleasant Hill reached out to work with some of the agencies that were responsible for helping provide shelter for homeless and uh, address those needs there. And that's a, a good example of how important it is to be aware of what's going on in your local community and thinking about how our information suite can help them out, not only in the next few days, but in this sub-seasonal timeframe. Uh, Grand Forks, and a couple other offices have a freeze dashboard where they include the day one to seven min temperature forecasts in the week two to one month outlooks as well as climatological risk information uh, both in, in tabular and map formats so again this is a good example of marrying 
the past climatological data uh, with the forecasts, both our regular weather forecasts and the climate forecasts, all in one location. Uh, winter outlooks do generate a lot of interest. I have examples here from La Crosse and Indianapolis. Uh, there are different ways that they share it. La Crosse has a, a nice web page in Indianapolis put together uh, sit rep. And this would be a good topic for a media push since interest from the public is so high. Extreme cold, there were a number of offices that hit hit this up this year. There are plenty of opportunities to. Here's an example appropriately from DLH from Duluth. They have a forecast sampler app that uh, where they plot the temperatures and show the downward trend to the extremely cold values and uh, hit the uh, the aspect that this is life-threatening cold in this time frame. And you know, when providing that type of lead time, sort of in the six to ten to eight to fourteen day time range. Uh, people can make judgments of things that maybe they plan to do next week that they could do this week to avoid that extreme cold. Ice jam threats uh, from Hastings. Uh, ice jams can be anticipated. There's actually a freezing degree day tool where you accumulate basically a certain amount of, of cold weather and that correlates with the development of ice on area rivers and freeze up ice jams and whatnot. And by adding your day one or day week one temperature outlook in with CPC's week two outlook can give you some indication of when we'll have sufficient cold to promote ice development and ice jams might begin to become problematic. So Really, what we're doing is just extending the forecast time frame from the day one to seven world where we commonly live in out to week two. Spring flood outlooks. Here's examples from the Rock and Rapid City. Um, the time frame that these things evolve on fits very nicely into the subseasonal climate time frames because you're you're working with things like snowpack and melt of the snowpack and soil moisture uh, status and whether soils are frozen or not. Uh, you can take a look at your current river levels too and uh, piece all that together uh, and provide uh, some thoughts as, as what sort of impacts there be on the flood side. It's also uh, anytime you're talking about water, uh, the flip side of drought can come into the discussion. And again, uh, these are things that can be addressed on the regional level for regional users, but have similar and more localized messages coming out from us in the WFO as to what this means locally. So extreme heat, the flip side of extreme cold uh, from Aberdeen, uh, just sharing the uh, transition to uh, the really extremely hot temperatures and, and high heat indices in their area. A drought dashboard, I know this one's from Indianapolis and we in La Crosse have one uh, using these tabs. This is the type of content that's typically shown in the regional drought briefings, which has been vetted uh, through our customer community. The neat thing about these pages is that they auto update and require little in the way of, of maintenance and also can make for a good uh, self briefing for folks in the office. And it also provides a landing spot for our drought statements. We do have our drought statements showing up on the NIDIS webpage. Uh, but having them on our local web page just broadens the distribution. There's a drought sit rep we put together last year that will be part of the new uh, DSS toolkit. Again, another 
largely auto populating template with the content based on uh, what's used in the regional webinars. And there's room to add some local impact information as well. Uh, river forecasts, the Ohio River RFC uses a CFS ensemble uh, run through their hydro models along with their historic uh, data uh, plotted there on the graph to get a sense of what the future might look like in terms of river levels. And they do this to support Corps of Engineer construction projects on their lock and dam. They also uh, can tie this to their uh, hydrologic ensemble system output and where you can put the uh, ensemble median in a perspective with what uh, what the ensemble is showing as the range of possible outcomes. And again, that's that contextualization. And this is a tool among other things that they use for their Lake Erie inflow forecasts, which are again tied to the algal bloom issues. Uh, hydrology flood sit reps, this is from our office as well as the the NCRFC, we worked pretty closely together on this, where week two showed higher probabilities of uh, above normal rainfall, but the hazard outlook showed the greatest risk for the heaviest rain was to our southwest. Uh, that was very important to messaging. So our assessment was that worst case scenario was probably not headed our way but it still wasn't going to be good. But the RFC was able to run with the, the NACE precipitation here and provide us some hydrographs that show contingencies for what could possibly happen. What if that worst case scenario did happen over us? That's the, the higher hydrograph there. And then the, the lower end hydrograph there is kind of a without significant precipitation. So that gives us a, a range of potential outcomes and information, valuable information that we can share with decision makers that help help them in, in their process. I mentioned the area forecast discussions. There's two aspects where climate can work here. One is we have a, a tool where uh, the record lows can be grabbed from the climate database and added if you're in a situation with record lows or highs. Uh, those can be automatically added to the AFD, which the media really appreciates. And we can also add a little tidbit or two to highlight the week two discussion and bring that to the attention of the media as well as the, uh, the general public. It's amazing. How often I hear that uh, non-technical, just random general public people actually are reading our area forecast discussions, uh, even to the point of recognizing, believe it or not, the style of individual forecasters and how they write the AFD. They can tell who's writing it just by the, uh, the style. So there's some serious fans of that product out there. Here's a climate blog from Grand Rapids, and you can see some of the uh, things they put on their blog, the flood event, the drought update, a release about the climate normals that just came out, and, and so on. Weather stories from Minneapolis. I really like this setup. These are two examples of, of kind of the same theme here, where the bar chart on the left is their week one forecast you know right out of our uh, right out of our grids and then they blend that right into the week two so you see on the left they're starting out pretty warm but then temperatures uh, crash significantly dropping you know, 25 to 30 degrees and then they show that in in week two in the second week of May that odds are favoring those below normal temperatures to continue. So this is a good example, uh, actually a perfect example of the concept of the 
seamless suite of information. And similar example on the right side there, but more addressing uh, warmer or milder temperatures. Social media, uh, there's a whole a whole slew of information in different ways where you can nab a graphic and put a little text to it, uh, bearing record temperatures after they occur is really handy. Uh, there's a lot of interest in stuff like that. So there's a, a lot of tools and graphics out there that we can use in the DSS process. I could actually go on another hour or longer and address that. I won't do that to you, but Patrick Ide and I are going to work on uh, an annotated resource document of web links uh, that you can use that in, include tools to uh, to add value or context and help us message uh, week two information. And when we get that document put together, we'll email that to the climate service leads in the SUs and WCMs. So to wrap up here as we head toward the top of the hour, uh, climate has a long history of DSS. Uh, people realized early on that the climate data and the climate outlooks really have little value if nobody's using them to make a decision or an assessment uh, of some kind. So the community as a whole, even beyond the Weather Service, has been engaged. Uh, and in fact, this was the driver behind the development of the regional climate centers back in the 1980s. The climate community has long been uh, focused on targets of opportunity and the use of probability, something we in the Weather Service or in the weather community in the weather service in the week one are picking up on. Uh, I want to emphasize the importance of partner interactions and training them up on this information and also gathering what sort of needs and interest uh, they might have. And to emphasize the seamless suite con concept and uh, break down the week one and week two plus silos. In other words, just stream the information out there as a, a continuous feed uh, rather than put things into stovepipes of this is weather and this is climate. I, I think this is really the simplest way the message and the way we're headed in the future. And with that, Randy, I'll take any questions if there are any.